Doctor Who's 60th anniversary is over. So it's time to catch up on the 14th Doctor's adventures so far, the big important things that happened in them, and where they fit into the timeline. In this episode, we'll of course look at the three TV specials, but we've also got the 14th Doctor reading a bedtime story to find a place for on his timeline, as well as a comic to slot in. And we might need to reassess a short story we looked at last time and its placement, which may not be as simple as we once thought. Welcome! to the 14th Doctor Canon Catch-Up. First, let's have another quick look at the short stories Out of Control and Into Control that first appeared in the 2024 Doctor Who Annual, where the second part took the form of a comic, and then in the short story anthology book 10 Days of Christmas, in which the second part was told in prose. I said in the last episode of the catch-up that we'd have to see if there was room for this to fit before the Star Beast, and yes, there is. The Star Beast never establishes how long it's been since the Doctor has regenerated. I bet Big Finish are rubbing their hands with glee at that potential. All we know is that it's sometime after one hour, 15 minutes after the regeneration to account for the comic liberation of the Daleks and the Children in Need short Destination Scarrow, which we covered last time. But it could be days, weeks, months, or even years after Destination Scarrow. We just don't know. So plenty of time for this two-part story to fit. One thing I noticed on a reread, though, is that it does have a sonic screwdriver in this story. The 13th Doctor's Sonic was destroyed in the Liberation of the Daleks comic, and he is still without one during Destination Scarrow. However, by the time of the Star Beast, he already has a new one, so it's possible he made one in another unseen adventure, or just in some downtime in the TARDIS, and then had it for this story. There is another possibility though, which is one we'll come back to a little later in the video. The Star Beast. Then we have the first of the 60th anniversary TV episodes. The 14th Doctor arrives in Camden, London, an indeterminate amount of time after the Destination Scarrow short. There he runs into his old pal Donna Noble, which is bad because last time they saw each other, he wiped her memory to save her life and if she remembers him, she will die due to absorbing the Time Lord essence and, and becoming the Doctor Donna and all that stuff that happened in Series 4. But there's no time to worry about that because a spaceship crashes nearby. Donna's daughter Rose finds the ship's occupant, the Meep, and takes it home, but the Meep is being chased by the Raff Warriors. Long story short, the Meep is actually an evil despot on the run from justice, and the Doctor, Donna, and Rose stop the Meep's evil plans. But to do so, Donna has to get her memory back, which almost kills her. But because she had a child, the Time Lord essence within her has been shared, and it is no longer lethal. Her and Rose then let the Time Lord Metacrisis energy go. Yeah, just like that. Makes you wonder why Donna didn't just do that in the first place, doesn't it? Anyway, the Meep cryptically alludes to a boss who will be interested in another creature with two hearts before being taken away by the Wrath to face justice. The Doctor then offers Donna a quick trip in the TARDIS, but she initially refuses, saying she needs to stay with her family. She does, however, eventually agree to take a micro trip just to visit her granddad Wilf in the care home. Which would have been fine if Donna hadn't then spilt coffee on the console, which sends it all a bit haywire and explodey. And then, if you don't get Doctor Who magazine, you may not know that the Doctor and Donna didn't go straight from spilling coffee to Isaac Newton's tree. The on-fire TARDIS made several stop-offs on the way in a series of mini-comics in issue 598 of Doctor Who magazine. First, they find themselves in the middle of a World War I airplane dogfight before they and a German plane get abducted by aliens, the brigade of the Gubernators, who hijack skilled pilots to use them in space battles. The Doctor frees the TARDIS and the German plane from the alien tractor beam with his sonic, but an alien squid-like thing, one of the brigade, has attached itself to the TARDIS. Next, the TARDIS takes them to an island full of Neanderthal-like primitive people, and when Donna distracts one of them involved in a fight, allowing another one to win that fight, the tribe starts to worship Donna. The Doctor and Donna quickly leave, but the tribe build a wooden statue to Donna, which is discovered along with the Missing Link tribe by explorer Roxton Vincey in 1878. 
Next up is 1066, and right in the middle of the Battle of Hastings, where first they save King Harold from getting an arrow in the eye. It's okay though, because historians apparently think that it may not have been Harold depicted in that bit of the Bayeux tapestry anyway. The TARDIS ended up on the missing bit of the tapestry, and it's missing because the Doctor removed it in the year 1111. Oh, and that mechanical squid from their first mini trip? It's gone into the TARDIS now, and it's on Donna's head. It's trying to take over Donna because it thinks she's the pilot of the TARDIS, but when it realises that's the Doctor, it attacks him instead. They stumble out of the TARDIS and backstage of a Morecambe and Wise show in the 1970s, before they stumble back into the TARDIS and materialise in the sky above London, still in the 1970s. They manage to trick the squid into abandoning the TARDIS, Falling to its death, it self-destructs in the sky, causing a shockwave which disturbs a child Donna's nativity play in a nearby church. The TARDIS is still on fire though, so... The second of the TV anniversary episodes first has the TARDIS crash into a tree under which Isaac Newton sits. It is still on fire, the TARDIS that is, not the tree, as the Doctor and Donna poke their heads out briefly and interact with Newton during which time he mishears them, causing history to be slightly altered so that the pull of large masses is named Mavity instead of Gravity. They don't stick around for long though, as they soon rather dramatically land in a spaceship on the edge of the universe. And while they are outside the TARDIS, the TARDIS runs away. That's due to the HADS, the Hostile Action Displacement System which takes the TARDIS away when there's a threat to itself and only returns when the threat is over. The Doctor thought he'd turned it off, but apparently it's back on now. On the ship, they encounter the Not-Things, life forms who take on the appearance and memories of their prey, and a lot of trying to work out which person is a fake in shoes. At one point, the Doctor stalls the Not-Things by invoking a superstition that supernatural creatures can't cross spilt salt without counting every grain. In doing this, at the edge of the universe, it's later revealed he may have opened up the possibilities for things to cross over more easily from other universes, something which will have consequences in the very next episode and beyond into the 15th Doctor's era. Luckily, the captain of the ship, who is now floating around dead outside, started an automated, very slow process to turn the whole ship into a bomb to kill the not-things. The Doctor and Donna make it out, in the return TARDIS just in time to not get caught in the explosion, but not before the Doctor accidentally takes the fake Donna onto the TARDIS to start with. It's okay though, he works it out and kicks that one out and picks up the proper Donna before she explodes. They arrive back in Camden, but two days after they left, to find a waiting Wilfred Mott, Donna's grandfather, who tells them people are going insane before a passenger plane flies dangerously close overhead, leading straight into... The Giggle. Picking up immediately from Wild Blue Yonder, The Giggle sees the population being driven to always think they are right with absolutely everything. By a message hidden in all screens since the invention of television, the laughing puppet of Suki Bill. The real life historical puppet used by television inventor John Logie Baird. This is obviously bad news, and the world is going to pot as people fight, disobey any rule that inconveniences them, and generally just kind of act like dicks. UNIT has developed a small armband device that nullifies the effect on individuals though, so at least they're okay. Talking of UNIT, Mel Bush is now working there. Former companion to the 6th and 7th Doctors, she had left travelling with the Doctor to travel with a semi-reformed con man Sabalon Glitz instead. He's now dead apparently, having died aged 101 falling over a whiskey bottle, and Mel managed to find transport back to Earth. We actually last saw her briefly in the power of the Doctor, attending the former Companions support group. The Doctor and Donna go back in time to the 1920s to find the origin of the Suki Bill transmission and find the Toymaker looking for a rematch with the Doctor. They had battled once before during the first Doctor's era, when the TARDIS had landed in the Toymaker's realm. It seems that the 14th Doctor invoking a superstition at the edge of the universe allowed him to cross over into their universe. In expanded media, the Doctor had encountered the Toymaker several times since that initial meeting with the First Doctor, including as the Sixth Doctor and multiple encounters as the Eighth Doctor. But the way the two talk in the giggle, it sounds as though they haven't met since that encounter with the Doctor when he was the First Doctor. So for all those who like to include everything in their head canon, expanded universe and all, 
Perhaps maybe the Time War erased those other encounters. It's a timey-wimey show. We can get over contradictions easily with a bit of head cannon. Initially trapped in the toy maker's domain within his toy shop, the Doctor challenges and loses a game against the toy maker, but reminds him that that actually makes them one all, so it's best out of three. They escape and head back to 2023, where the toy maker attacks Unit HQ and kills the Doctor, forcing him to begin to regenerate. But instead of a standard regeneration, he bigenerates, splitting into two one remaining the 14th Doctor and the other being the new 15th Doctor. The duo of Doctors challenge the Toymaker to a new game, one of catch, which the Toymaker loses. And as his prize, the Doctor chooses to banish him. The Toymaker flattens and folds up into a box, which Unit takes away for safekeeping. I wonder if we'll see that again. Oh, the Toymaker's gold tooth remains though, and falls to the floor, unseen by everyone there. Earlier, he'd said that he held Prisoner the Master in his gold tooth after the Toymaker had beaten him in a game. We see a mysterious female hand pick up the tooth when no one is looking. Because there were two Doctors, they get two prizes, the other prize being to duplicate the TARDIS so that both of the Doctors would have one. The 15th Doctor then sets off for new adventures, and the 14th goes to rest a bit and settle down for a bit, which seems to involve having lunch with Donna's family in the garden. He does mention that he still goes on trips in the TARDIS though, including taking Mel and Rose for some quick trips here and there. But, as the 14th Doctor is still around and still has a TARDIS, let's look at that short story again, because it could take place after the giggle. He definitely has a Sonic by this point, he has a TARDIS, and he's using it at least some of the time. So it's a possibility. However, some of the things he says in this short story does indicate that he doesn't yet know why he has this face back, which might lead more into it being pre the actual TV episodes. But as well as this short story, there's the final 14th Doctor story that could go here too. The CBB's Bedtime Story. The Doctor arrives on Planet Bedtime Stories, He's familiar with the planet and obviously knows its ways because he immediately breaks the fourth wall to talk directly to the audience and tell them a story. He reads the book The Way Back Home by Oliver Jeffries. This could also be between Destination Scarrow and the Star Beast, but if you think about the strange way Planet Bedtime Stories works, it sort of makes sense for it to happen after the Salt at the End of the Universe incident more magical elements are bleeding over from other universes, and perhaps the planets where people sit down and read stories back to one of those other universes, aka ours, is one of those elements. So I think I'm going to put this one after the giggle. And that's it for the 14th Doctor Canon catch-up for now. Because, who knows, he might be back with more adventures, and if he is, I'll make sure to make more episodes of this covering it. But it's not the end for the Canon catch-up either. It'll soon regenerate into the 15th Doctor canon catch-up, trying to map every single story the 15th Doctor appears in across all media in a coherent timeline. Will I manage to keep up with it all? We will see. In the meantime, let me know what your favourite 14th Doctor story was and maybe check out this playlist of the Time Lord Victorious canon update series to find out how that multi-platform event all fit together. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. See you soon.